Polly Brown lives in Hopkinton and notes that she walks almost every day, no matter what the weather, and writes not quite that faithfully in Hopkinton, but she writes a great deal. And when she does write, uh, she goes on fire with her words in wonderful ways. She has been a longtime member of the Boston area group of poets called Every Other Thursday. And Polly has taught at the Worcester Art Museum in private groups, libraries, and at the Mass Poetry Festival. So we're very much looking forward to this. Please give a warm welcome to Polly Brown. So Cheryl was one of the poets <clears throat> who gave me important encouragement when, when I was working through the challenges of being simultaneously daughter and editor. And if, if you, if you, even if you haven't done that, if you stop and think about it, you can imagine it being uh, challenging. And if you add in the fact that that person was your first poetry mentor, right? The person who, who made it seem normal to write poems. Um, a tall order, and standing here feels like a tall order too, but I'm very grateful for it. So thank you to Cheryl for the help she gave me then and for this opportunity now. And thank you also to Mike Tarosian of HCAM who helped with the photos which will let Jeannie join me here, sort of. So um, this is a fairly recent photograph taken just a couple months ago by my sister, um, about a month before she died. Um, and, and it's pretty true to her. It's got that warm, delighted smile, the Red Sox shirt, which was one of many, some of them pretty insulting to people who were not Red Sox fans, <laughs> and, and the complete absence of makeup or any other sort of modification of her, of her wonderful, stubborn, authentic self. And here she is about 30 years ago, when she first wrote some of the poems that I'm going to read. I have 10 photographs, 10 poems. I hope I can fit them all in. This is called Spring Ditch. Where can we go on a fickle day, mild, over mud leaking, clutter piled snow. How can we celebrate the spring? I know a place where two could stoop and stare, struck by the curling of water in gutter, hazarding mud, stone, and stick boat against flow. As reborn we grow, to old knowledge. Give up your care and sing. Embrace the itch. Bring boots and share the damning of the ditch. She wrote in, in many tones and many voices. This one is angry and um, it's about a cat. So Cheryl set me up for this. <laughs> the mouse speaks. Him? It makes no difference that he isn't hungry. He hunts by whim. Full of his fish and cream, he sits and watches through one half-closed eye hoping I might forget or by some false security persuade myself he doesn't matter anyway. If for one moment I seem sure some plan of mine 
is destined to succeed. He'll stop his drowsing pounce, and I will know, though knowledge can avail me nothing, he is, and he is power. He waits until it suits him, teases now and then, congratulates himself on my great fearing. He waits until a game begins to bore him. Then he stretches, and I must die and die again until his game is over. I don't think it's really about a cat. And this is a poem about love. Morning Dove. Dull winter skies drop their quiet snow, and even the pines stand veiled and dim. Then muted colors begin to grow, and Morning Dove on her poplar limb reveals what the bright sun hid before, the blush on her breast that redeems the gray. So facing another lonely day, I warm at the thought of him. So, Jean did, she wrote poems almost all her life, starting when she was very young and, and going almost to the end. She kept working on individual poems as her style evolved. Um, she would type them and then mark them up. Oh, wait, go back. Type them and then mark them up and then retype them and then mark them up again. So when, when we finally came to, I insisted on it, that we sort out this big box labeled poetry, we found 400 poems, more than 400 poems. And in some cases, as many as 10 different versions of the same poem. She was not publishing any of them. Um, she was reading a lot of poets, but didn't know many poets. And I think, I think that's part of the originality and um, uniqueness of her voice, in a way, right? That, that it was hers. So eventually, I got them all sorted out into plastic sleeves in binders, all the different versions of one poem in the same sleeve. I've talked with other people who've done similar works of literary archaeology. I keep doing that. And um, one way or another, they've all faced that same problem. How do you decide which one is the real, the real one? In, in my case, she was still there. And she could say, she could say. At some point, we started talking about a book. So we, had, we were able to do a lot of the preliminary work in the summers we spent together at her farm in Maine. But in the final stages, she had gone to live in a series of care facilities. So here she is in her not very large room in the wonderful care facility in New Jersey where she wound up called Green Hill. And she's sitting at a collapsible table. My, my sister had found a way to shoehorn into the room. You, you can get a sense from the photograph. And she's talking with me on the phone. Uh, she, has, she has one stage of manuscript there. And, and 
No matter how her mind was changing by this point, working with her poems always, always, always brought out her, her sharpest self. Sharp in more than one sense. So for the poem I showed you a minute ago, with the revisions, Jeannie said, I, I know you like that title, Transcendental, you and your Henry David Thoreau, but um, it's a terrible title and we have to find another. <laughs> She's absolutely adamant. So it wound up being called Returned as Fire, which is from the poem itself and, and, and so wonderful that we almost titled the book that. Returned as Fire. I am the tree and tire, root, branch, and twig, leaf, blossom, fruit, and seed from which more trees shall spring. Now in the green and giddy summer, I am leaf, partnered by wind, made clean by rain, giving my shade to who may stand beneath. But in the fall, when sap has ceased to bring me life and dry leaves wreathe my trunk where once you stood, I shall be old and tired enough to sleep. When winter cold blows through, in death my wood may reap my human soul's desire and warm my loves once more returned as fire. So part of what I love about them you know, the early ones, and I, and I insisted that we put a few in here, are kind of sing-song, old-fashioned, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. But then somehow she gave herself this freedom to, to, to dance around in the rhythm, to have many of the rhymes be interior rhymes or not worry about rhymes at all in a life that was in many ways very constrained, the poems had had a degree of freedom she did not have. And um, all of us should wish for that, yes? I'm going to read the, the title poem, and she gave it this title, Evolution. How shall my life tree be now you have left me? Once again, knife pruned and human tamed, blossom giddy, orchard neat, apple gaudy, then naked and sad. Oh no, not I. I'll be a cedar tree. Heart kept and weather wise, high on the mountainside, yearning and bending, living on lichen soil. Only the sharp winds and star clouds and wild rains will witness my dying. Yes, but the soul of me doubting must ponder. Was apple tree ever, by giving thought, transformed to cedar? This is one of the few that, that has sort of my, my fingerprint on it. It was a much longer poem that she said didn't work, and I lifted out four, four pieces, and, and she endorsed that. Um, she was a walker also, and this is called Walking One. I felt the warmth 
watched chuckle water in the ditches, heard rapturous chickadees call from dark pines on Blueberry Hill. I counted the winter's throwaways returned by shrinking snowbanks, two spark plugs, a broken spring, three beer cans. Two. Seeing the snow still deep along the hill above the pond, I wondered how have the mayflowers wintered under their windproof blanket? Will they be larger and brighter, more fragrant this year? Three. Home again, I heard woodpeckers tapping for food. In the ancient maple, whose every spring comes as if it must be the last. Woodpeckers, bugs, and stubborn old age seem to balance, and I am the only one who fears the wind. Four. I am too old now to look for perfection expecting to find it. You can aim at perfection as long as you know in your bones it will stay out of reach. Galls on the sumac and bugs in the maples, everything flawed somehow. Beautiful still. And I show up in this one also. I'm the one yelling out the flower names. It's called Earth Daughters. This happened in Southboro. Marsh marigolds, she notes, as we round the corner by the brook. And in my head, I hear a timeless chorus, my mother's voice and mine joining hers, skunk cabbage, as we compile the catalog of spring. So they're, they're wonderful, yeah? They're wonderful. But the same, you know, high standards, uh, the same greater familiarity with unknown, well-known, unknown to her, but well-known poets, and, and lack of, of, uh, of peers like herself, other than me, that kept her revising and revising and revising and revising, just aiming so high to good effect, I think. But that same thing made it really hard for her to say, these are, these are worth putting into a book. Furthermore, we're almost done. She decided that we needed what she referred to as the opinions of poets who are not my daughter. <laughs> and, and she was just thrilled when the generous volunteers that I found turned out to be Bonnie Bishop and Consquires, who are here, out there, somewhere, whose books she owned because I'd given them to her. And she was right. She was really right. What Bonnie and Con could do was to, to look at it from a step back and, and to suggest cuts that strengthened what remained. And above all, what they could do was say to her, these are real. This is a real book. Get on with it. So finally, I am skipping a lot, Alex and I arrived in her room at the end of last summer with actual copies of a book. <laughs> um, Sarah Bennett, um, another old friend who does design work for books of poems. If you have a book of poems in the works and you need a designer, you could not, you could not find a better one. She helped with far more than just the design. She also made it happen really fast. And we needed that. 
because I wanted her to see it when she still knew that all those poems were hers. And when she could still read, when she could read them herself. In her very last hours, Alex, with his wonderful deep voice, read, read many of them to her. Often on those last days, we were reading them to her. But, but I, this is probably my favorite of all the photographs because, you know, there she is, that, that person who had fallen in love with books as a tiny child, had passed that love on to three daughters and eight grandchildren and six great-grandchildren so far, and countless, countless other adopted children from, from all her library work. Um, people I don't know the names of. So here she is, that, that wonderful reader, irresistibly drawn into a book that she herself wrote. She opens it, and she can't stop reading. So, you know, full circle. So these are two friends from her little town in Maine, near Sharon, people she'd known for many, many years. She knew Ben when he was roughly the age of Bradley. She had shared her work with me and with some other family members, but most of the people she knew not only had not seen her work, they had no idea that she was doing it. They had no idea that she was writing poems. Whenever I say, oh, golly, I wish I'd done this sooner, which I have said a lot of times. My sister Nan, who, who you know, has more of my mother's toughness than I do, says she wouldn't have let you sooner. And it's probably true, right? Very, very private person. Um, giving herself a kind of freedom in these poems that, that, that her social person didn't and couldn't have. So when we started talking books, she had really strong opinions about what could go public, as she put it, and what needed to stay just in an archive for the family. So many more in the second category than in the first. But at the same time, she, she knew that her poems, you know, had stories in them about the beauties of the place where she had lived, but also about loss and courage. And um, just hanging on. And the role of the beauty in the place where you live in helping you hang on. And beyond any mixed feelings in the process, you know, right, right, all the way through, there was this tug of war going on. Ultimately, she decided to share that. So this is a gathering she could not be at in, in Maine of old friends and neighbors um, who chose poems from the book and read them on the spot. These people she hadn't been able to trust would appreciate her poems. It was just uh, you know, one of the best afternoons of my life. And then we, we did a similar kind of reading at her care facility. Um, with Erica, the head Shabazz, they're called, these wonderful caregivers are called Shabazz. Um, reading, several of the caregivers cried as they read poems. It, it gave them a way to know my mother. And Jeannie was able to read a poem herself, a really short one that is one of my favorites.
It's called Silence, 3 a.m. I don't think she wrote this in Maine. I think this was, you know, in one of her visits to her family. The place she lived was pretty silent. Silence, 3 a.m. The silence now is wonderful, so wide and dark and deep. I wonder if I woke from needing silence more than sleep. Somebody, I can't remember who, read this one. It's called Promise. The sailor promises himself on this task or the next, I may well find myself home. When the time comes, I'll be relieved to hand over my loves to each other, minus me, so they can concentrate on where and to what their own lives have led them. which I, I guess is what I'm struggling to do now. Part, part of grief, right, is um, facing again that, that shock of mortality that we all wander around ignoring the best we can, right? That's, we got to Boom. There it is. And, and to me, it seems like the mortality we live with all the time is, is the, the impossibility of doing for the people we love everything we wish we could do for them. Mm -hmm.